So firstly, thank you so much for, uh, for making the time to join us today. Um, it's not a presentation in the form of uh, we're going to tell you all the answers because I think it would be fair to say that we're all navigating quite a new space. Um, the situation is, is changing uh, on, on an hourly basis and uh, I think the, the number of people um, that we have, uh, so 25 people uh, who have joined us today is, is evidence that, you know, that this is an interesting space. And, and interestingly, even those schools that, you know, have got things in place, feel like they've got this under control, are still, you know, obviously interested to see what else is out there. What other options do we have um, if we move to uh, remote learning? So uh, it was short notice, I know. So thank you to all who, who joined us. It actually started as a result, Esther Hill from All Saints, uh, who is just waving at you now, um, was over in um, Victoria um, doing a bit of preparation for her or doing her initial presentation uh, as part of her PhD. And we were talking about um, the what they had in place already and I thought that would be a great starter a little bit of a taster to this conversation um, and so I'm going to hand over to Esther now we're going to have a little bit of a discussion um, and she's going to tell us a little bit about what's happening at All Saints okay so Esther um, can you perhaps tell us a little bit about what's happening at All Saints currently Good morning, everyone. It's um, eight o'clock in the morning over in Perth. We're three hours behind the east, so it's a bit of an early morning for me this morning to get it, get my kids to school and make sure that everything's happening. So we're still at school in WA, um, and um, I think we're probably a little bit behind the eastern states in terms of in terms of where things are happening from a from a government sort of level. But we've been preparing for a school closure for probably about a month or so now. And I, I was talking to Peter about some of the key principles, I guess, that we've, um, we've used in, in, in putting our plans together. And our plans are certainly not the most perfect plans, but they're, they're plans nonetheless that we're really happy to share with you. So the first principle that we were working on was really that uh, the idea that we're going to have a full cohort of staff who can simply deliver what we're doing in a face-to-face -face environment and whack that straight online is just completely unrealistic. So we would es estimate anywhere from 20 to 60% of our staff are going to be unavailable because of the various things that are going on in their lives with children that they need to look after or um, family members who they need to care for, etc. So we absolutely don't feel like we would be in a position to firstly offer our students a seamless kind of experience if we were doing that. But more to the point, I think in, in the current scenario, it's very stressful and I know how fantastic our teachers are and what our teachers would be trying to do would be, no matter what the circumstances, be online and delivering those lessons to those kids every day in the same way they're used to. And I just don't think it would be good for them. And so that's been, that's been one of the key principles about the design that we've come up with. Can I just stop you there for a moment, Esther, because, you know, having spoken to a lot of principals, um, I guess, you know, one of the fears that they have and, and that I certainly share is that for many schools, um, they, they will have just adopted almost like a let's replicate school. So we'll run the normal timetable. It'll just be remote. Um, the assumption would be that all students will have um, equipment and band, bandwidth, but it really does presuppose that all your teachers are going to be available. So, you know, you, you know how difficult it is to get quality education when, when a teacher's away. I think it's going to be almost impossible to, to have a, you know, a substitute teacher covering your class, um, you know, when, you, when you're not online because you might be dealing with elderly parents, etc. I know some schools have really gone to the extreme of uh, running school as usual from home to the point where David was telling me this morning, there's actually schools that are talking about making sure that their students are wearing school uniform. Mm. So I guess, I guess those, those ideas have really guided us and we feel really strongly that that is the case. And so 
What that means, um, I'm talking from a senior, a senior secondary context. Uh, the junior school have a, a different structure. We're a pre kindy to year 12 school. Um, so the, the key principles that we've used are where, where can we collapse classes? So rather than five year eight English classes running, we have one teacher delivering, de delivering a year eight English class. So that's one of the key principles. And so we've set up a structure where we have a lead teacher and a backup teacher. And we've based those lead and backup teachers on a survey that we administered with staff, which really tells us who are the most likely people to be unavailable, who's got childcare responsibilities. So, you know, that's one of the first initial things that we did was to run those surveys to see in the, in the event that we do have to close, make sure we've got the data. And that, that survey also included um, what's your capabilities at home? Do you need school to provide you anything? Do you have access to equipment? Is there anything that we need to put in place for that? So some comprehensive surveys. So essentially we've got we've got two, we've got sort of three pieces to our to our structure that we're planning. The first is a seven to ten space, and that is around collapsing the timetable, shaving away as much as we can. We're a, a high fee paying independent school. So our families will expect that there will be a continuity of service. So we can't just sort of say, well, let's just completely rewrite it. So we are having what we call mesh subjects, the math, English, science, you know, continuing with a modified program. Um, and then we've, we've got alongside the modified program of curriculum, we've also structured wellbeing and elective options. And those, those wellbeing and elective options are based around the teachers who can be redeployed, so who are no longer needed to deliver their regular classes, but we're redeploying them to come up with some creative and relevant kinds of offerings for students around wellbeing or around electives. So it might be, you know, how to cook something at home using the stuff that's in your pantry, or it might be a kind of... Um, you know, a home workout from the phys ed department or a composition competition from the from the music department. And then we've got some wellbeing things as well that are going on at the same time. So so that's the seven to ten space. And then the eleven Esther, and twelve sorry, Esther, just just on that one, just a, yeah. a query. With when the electives are running, how much of that is two way? So, you know, like um, a phys ed teacher, you know, putting together a workout video, that again is one way. How much of it is um, opportunity for collaboration in, in, that, look, in that subject? Yeah, look, we're really lucky in that um, as, as the school that we are, we have great, great facilities in terms of online delivery. And so we're using uh, our Teams platform and we've been doing lots of experimenting with that over a long period of time, not just this period of time. So it is very much two way. So the, the capacity for that to be two ways is fantastic, yeah. So mm -hmm. just, just in addition to that, um, I'll just add the year 11 and 12 piece. So the year 11 and 12 piece is the students are following their, um, their timetable, but with structured things. One of the key things that I've said to staff is that we are not simply taking the next thing that's in your assessment program and shoehorning that into an online environment. We're absolutely trying to choose the best pieces of content or um, concepts or ideas and putting that as at, certainly as the first piece that we'll be, we will be using and then building from there. So we're not anticipating that we will just continue moving through an assessment program that we've got set up for the sake of doing that. And particularly in seven to 10, we don't feel like there's any necessity to do that. If we do no assessment, we don't follow any program and we still have learning occurring. So our priority is learning and engagement um, I have real concerns about the level of engagement that we can have in an online environment. So a lot of our focus has been around how do we get that connection in that two way and how do we make sure it's engaging. Um, yes, so how are you monitoring wellbeing of students? Uh, so we've got a, a bunch of things in place for that. So we've got um, our wellbeing sort of team uh, structuring wellbeing periods. So a part of the day each day is an interactive period with with our wellbeing team. Um, we've also got individual check-ins for, for those, for, those um, for students. And we, we've also got a, a list of students that we've generated who we feel are the students who would be most at risk during that time so that we're ensuring that we, 
uh, connecting with them on a more regular basis and an individual basis as well. Um, I guess that leads to another thing which is around, I think one of our most vulnerable groups are those students who are accessing learning support. And so we've been putting quite a bit of energy into ensuring that we have a learning support team who are connecting with those, those kids who have diagnoses, who have modified programs, who, you know, we need to make sure that if we are delivering a single program that they're not getting the same as everyone else because it would absolutely kill them, especially in that static kind of environment at mm. home. So we've got a learning support team, again, with redeployed teachers who can join that team, who can actually sit one-on-one -on -one with those kids through our team structure. Um, so alongside our curriculum um, delivery, we've also got what we've set up as a help desk. So at any time during the day, we've got a range of teachers who are available in a help desk structure so that those kids who are working ahead or working behind or working at a different time because their family circumstances mean that they can't do that means that they can access those that help desk and there's you know there's a math teacher an English teacher a humanities teacher a, um, you know some year 12 subject teachers etc who are available during that time so we've created created a roster for that we mm. feel like that roster is going to be incredibly um, dynamic and so we've also set up a structure so that in the mornings we can have an uh, an off-site teams briefing with our with our teachers to see who's available for that day, make sure that we've got everything in place, and make sure that we can access a team to man the help desk and also um, deliver deliver the curriculum during that time. Esther, um, um, Chris Brown's written in saying the expectation of the diocese is the staff will be at school. Uh, and the kids will be at home and that staff who, sorry, no, I'm not great at reading, staff who need to be carers will be on leave. Um, so they've got a sort of a two-tiered response. Yeah. Um, is your expectation the same? What percentage of staff are you assuming will be in at, in at work? Uh, I think, I mean, we, we have two scenarios that we're working with. One is that we are all at home and the other is that we're, we have teachers on site and some teachers at home. I would say that if, if we're all on site, those teachers are at home, I think it would, we would be pushing it, I think, if they were to be delivering lessons. I think if we're all on site and some teachers are at home, I think they need to be off and we need to work without them. If we're all at home, we'll rely on that structure in the morning, a briefing time in the morning to see who is available and to make sure that we can man, man the decks in that way. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I guess one of the things is that we can, and you would be doing this, of course, is managing that on an individual basis. Like, you know, if you've got a staff member travelling an hour into work yeah. um, and they've got good bandwidth at home, you know, it probably doesn't make sense yeah. to have them there. No, that's right. And, you know, I think things will be very changing if we do go to a full school closure for a long period of time. And so we'll just have to monitor it day to day. And, you know, I've made it really clear to our staff that our structures that are in place are flexible as well. It may be that what we put in place doesn't work and we actually have to, to rewrite it and redesign the whole structure to make it work better. And on that, we've got, we've got some pretty um, amazing kids who are feeding into that. So we've got some kids who have their own website that's already set up. It's been set up since they were in year eight. They're in year 11 now and they run this website where the kids are actually running the curriculum and sharing things. And so um, hoping to to use that power of student agency to, to involve the kids in what's going on and make sure those feedback loops are there. Uh, my eldest is in hospitals and they're getting briefings on the four hours. Um, the scenario planning that they've got, you know, is, is quite extreme down to the point where they won't treat anyone um, who's over 50. Um, because they, they won't have the ICU beds to, to incubate. So that probably puts most of us um, <laughs> at, at somewhat risk. And my, my own, yeah, look, it's, it's just a gut feeling, but I think once the holidays have hit, the numbers are going to be spiking. And I think we at least have to be considering the scenario where schools are not reopened. The suggestion that I would have is that once students have been away for a two week break, 
the chip, like you know, to bring them back is like, you know, tantamount to just opening the floodgates because mm -hmm. they will have cross contaminated. And so um, to bring them back and certainly in a secondary setting, it's not possible, you know, to, to socially distance when they're doing five different subjects. So the notion certainly of bringing secondaries back on mass, I, I just don't even think that's workable. So mm -hmm. anyway, look, that's, I think we need to be planning for that scenario that it could indeed be um, you know, okay. I think on our on our scenario planning, we have to look at six, 12, 12 months. Um, you know that we we have to at least mentally be considering um, what those what those options are. I'm just going to put a put a poll up, or I hope I am. How prepared do you feel your school is for full remote learning? It is anonymous. Pete, as we go through the process of filling in the poll. Um, a query and a question came in regarding schools that aren't one-to-one -one, and has there been any scenario planning around those who may not have access to computers at home, in which case this virtual solution may not be the way forward. Mm. So maybe that's a, a query or a, um, a point worth pondering also. Yeah, because that, there'll obviously be links to socioeconomics there. Um, you know, one of the things that uh, again, we, we always, as humans, tend to think in binary. We always think of the schools as either being open or closed. Um, you know, clearly in some of the countries already, anyone that's um, a healthcare worker or police or transport or essential services, um, I think even if we were to close them, there would still be some skeleton service there. But, you know, if, the, if this was to play out, for, for more than say a few months, I think that schools could well consider having small um, units around the place so that students are still getting, you know, and they'd be generally around geographic areas, uh, some degree of, of age, but you know, whether we could set up small cells of, uh, of learners. So we, we had highly prepared, 11% feel that they're highly prepared. So that was two respondents prepared, four out of the 19. So 21%, I think we'll be okay, 53%, uh, which is the largest response. And not really sure was 16%. Around how broad are the scenarios that we're planning? You know, so it seems like a lot of conversation has sat within the one-to-one -one virtual planning space. Mm. What about schools or environments that either don't have access to that or the case where the band doesn't allow for that for periods of time? How do we then roll into something else? Yeah. Any thoughts around that? I've just heard like it's probably more schools in America, um, you know, talking about packet learning. That's such an American term to sort of making these packets. I guess, you know, in the absence, and, and we, we were joking yesterday, if Australia goes into lockdown and everybody's in um, at home, you know, to the extent that they can be, like, is our, are we even gonna have the internet? Like, is it going to, is it gonna collapse? And that's where we're laughing about, you know, having to go to a bit of paper-based plan B, plan C, plan D. So mm. um, we've, we've, we've set up Google Classroom um, years four to uh, twelve, but we're also having to provide paper, paper things as well because um, even right now all the internet's frozen. Can anyone hear me? Yeah. Hey, yeah, great, Stephen. Yeah. So um, we're um, we're printing out booklets as well, and to be quite honest, I'm yesterday when um, Scott Morrison was doing his live for um, you know conference briefing. Um, our internet froze a few times and I have quite strong concerns that in the event that we go to a societal shutdown that probably we're not going to have access so much to online learning as maybe people think we may. Um, so at the moment I've got staff planning sort of until the end of term with them also sort of queued until the end of week three next term. Um, but the game changes so quickly every day that it's... Um, yeah, it's like we've just modified our parent-teacher interviews. We're going to do that um, by phone because we've had a drop-off with not many people wanting to come in. Um, so, yeah, I think it's a really... <laughs> it's, a, it's like living on a sea at the moment with the up and downness of every day. Um, so devices are a real struggle for us. So we're quite trying to put something in place at least for year eight and nine. We've got devices for 11 and 12 and we've gone... DD 
seven and ten this year, but um, nice access and access to internet. There's another issue that we have. We live in the regional areas and I've got families um, that don't have access to the internet. We've done a survey with staff um, around their access. So yeah, it's not going to be um, foolproof. So, um, yeah, sorry that you can't see, but um, my school's in New Zealand and we have slightly different issues. Of course, we've not got community transference yet. Um, we are still at the early days, but the latest thing is that they, they are looking at closing up the communities. Uh, so we have um, had every teacher go home and connect to our different systems, the student management system, um, our uh, Gmail and, and just the usual cloud-based stuff and uh, we use Google so Google Classroom is, is the main way we'll be delivering that um, and we've also done a survey of the kids um, and they will be doing a practice at the start of next week where we have the year 10s stay at home and we'll deliver lessons uh, during the day uh, and then the year 9s and we, so sorry my school is a year 7 through to 10. So 11, 11 through to 15 kids. Uh, we've got 1,370 kids, 80 odd teachers and 30 odd support staff. So um, it's about also then there's the support staff issues who, you know, if you're a receptionist, uh, what can you do for the school? Uh, if, we're, yeah. if you're offline, if you're in the face-to-face -face contact, student desk and the like. Uh, so we've been uh, reviewing those. In terms of learning, which obviously is the important thing, um, yeah, we've also taken into account the kids who probably will need uh, some worksheets rather than online um, access. And as I say, well, the practice will, will bring us more into line with that. We'll, we'll have more information about who can access internet, um, who, who haven't got their devices. I did like the comment about phones because all the kids who don't have devices have definitely have phones. Um, yes, it's, um, I know this is a, a, a discussion, Peter, about learning, um, but really the, the, I'm feeling my biggest job is about managing perception at the moment. So it's managing the perception of our school community, um, parents, students, staff. It's all about perception, um, that we're being active and um, that their children are safe. Um, and what we're doing to try and, and, and support. So there's a real groundswell of um, people starting to have their children not come to school themselves. And, um, but also the health sector is really divided as to whether the school should shut or not. Do you want to share with us what's going on for you? Um, I'm in Bansdale, so regional, rural, small school, um, East Gippsland area of Victoria. So we have had an extremely disrupted start to our year with the bushfires um, and we are about to hit holidays at the end of next week. So I am trying to carry my school through to get a term of learning because we've only just got them settled. I think what it does highlight and has highlighted to me talking to a number of leaders uh, of late it does make you reflect on what's important in our in our job. Like we can sometimes get really hung up on timetables and um, you know uh, funding and all sorts of things like that. But what our communities are calling now for is is leadership. You know, it's very easy to to lead when times are you know good and uh, we've got a stable environment, but. You know, I think as long as we remember, and you know, I'm not telling you guys how to suck eggs, you know, if you're on screen, you're obviously an experienced leader in your own right, but it's, it's really about, you know, um, being prepared, trying to think a few steps ahead, but keeping that personal element, uh, you know, first and foremost, like, you know, um, uh, Leanne, and, or Leanne was mentioning in her group that a lot of her students may not have internet because they're in a remote area and, and finances pre preclude some students from having that. You know, as long as the human is looked after, then, you know, we're all going to get through this. You know, people did survive pre-internet. Um, just around some of the protocols around learning online and what that might look like. And in my reading, and I would love to hear from other people, I know I've, I've read some terrific stuff online um, that people are using, but... Just this idea of, of motivation and engagement is really, really important. And I think 
a lot of the protocols that we'll be putting in place are around motivation and engagement. So having really short-term uh, goals that are made really explicit and clear for a lesson or a period of time, but also having an arc in terms of where, where kids are going. I think both of those are really important because, you know, you don't want kids sitting there doing something but not feeling like it's what they're just sort of killing time. So I think, I think that's one of the protocols that I put in place for all staff. And so there's a shared language around those protocols as well that everyone is making explicit. These are the things that we're going to get done today. And, you know, it might be share this, do that, write this. And that's that's your that's your little list for for that for that period of time. But also, what what we do know is that kids work at incredibly different speeds, mm -hmm. and so it might be that this kid here knows they've they've done all that stuff, and so they want something else. And so how do you how do you make sure you've got protocols there to extend the kids or move them faster? But the other the other reason to have that sort of short term goals, medium term, long term goals listed is if that teacher who's delivering that stuff is not available, you've got a record of where they're going. So you can actually have some continuity for kids if that teacher drops out and we, d we can't deliver again. So I think, I think those, those clear protocols are really important. I guess my only concern with that is we run the risk of compliancing these kids rather than giving, like using this as an expansive opportunity. So yep. I think some kids, absolutely, Esther, will, will need that level of support. But surely, um, and, and I know you're not going against this, but for some students, why couldn't they come up with their own learning plan and say, you know what, I'm going to uh, lock myself away and I'm going to write a book or I'm going to do this piece of artwork and I'll be offline for three days. As long as somebody's checking <laughs> for them. Um, you know, why, why can't, you know, that way, that way we're actually working more intensively with those young people that need it. Totally agree. Um, I think I'm speaking from a particular context in terms of yeah. what are the deliverables in a high fee paying independent school. And, you know, I think that's, that's one of our deliverables is to maintain sp specific programs and, you know, paired back programs nonetheless. But I, I don't think there'd be any argument with, with having that kind of flexibility as well. Mm. Mm. I'm aware that um, uh, some of these schools have built within these platforms opportunities for stretch and challenge that all those kind of tasks that you speak about, Esther, yes, they are kind of set and prescribed because that's the audience and the context, but what they have added to those tasks are real open-ended uh, stretch and challenge tasks uh, that really don't take a normal amount of energy necessarily to create. Um, and, and then I'm also very conscious of the fact that uh, some of these schools that I know I've been in dialogue with in the last three days have large kind of uh, individual need type students where really that personalised approach for those students has been on a spectrum for quite some time. So having to, to deal with that personalised approach is, is the norm in some kind of settings and they are attempting it also to continue stretching these young people mm -hmm. through open kind of tasks that, you know, with, with a kind of project-based um philosophy to allow them the freedom and autonomy just to be creative and thinking because uh, if we're really serious about levels of engagement and, and maintaining interest, gee, we've got to hand over some of it to them because they, they, they're not going to have any contact with, with their colleagues or their friends for possibly weeks or months. months. So allow, allowing them to kind of remain curious and create is is an element of maintaining kind of their intrinsic motivation to learn. I guess my worry that none of us can solve is I just feel like the, the gap's going to widen between communities of young people who um, are already disadvantaged and yep. those who aren't. Because if I think a lot of the young, about a lot of the young people in my community, um, motivation is one of our greatest challenges even with the face-to-face -face and you know that malaise of apathy and everything that's going on mm. um, and i i just I, there's nothing we can do about it we can only do the best that we can do but i think that for us the human contact through the screen or the phone is going to be so critical just to keep going and for us a lot of our young people home is not a safe place to be so yeah. real concern amongst all of these things, I feel like we're getting these plans in place. But if you're in fight or flight 24-7, yeah. it's another yeah. layer. Is, is there a way that the, the, the school community could, could create a space um, for those that are perhaps 
in situations where the home is not an appropriate place. You mean a physical space? Is that what you're yeah. yeah. Yeah, well, that's the real challenge because it's, I'm not talking about like five or ten kids. <laughs> yeah. Scores and scores of kids. And um, that's a, it's a great suggestion, I guess. And that's having the flexible thinking, isn't it? Because it depends what um, restrictions are imposed on us as a school and as a community and all of those things. Um, mm -hmm. But even that, that child protection, checking around, you know, how do we check in and what are the protocols to ensure that staff are not um, being put in positions that make them more vulnerable because it's not in a public place. Yeah. So yeah, that's the other layer of um, things they're trying to consider. I'm just thinking about uh, like all the different ways that the, kid, the kids can show their learning and I'm starting to think about, you know, sending packs home um, with, you know, plasticine and clay and, I like that. and um, like origami paper and stuff like that because, mm. yeah, engagement is key and mm. I don't know how, you know, some of the content that we have to deliver is... Um, um, just, you know, it's ridiculous now. I, I think yeah. that I'm going to go for as creative as possible um, and very hands-on as well. I think we also need to consider that when parents are at home, if they're not used to working online, students are going to need parent participation in this as well, particularly in the primary sphere. Mm. And if parents are working from home, a lot of those parents aren't going to be able to dedicate all of their time to homeschooling that yeah. that you know they might be able to have some time but not all of that time so having things that can uh, occupy the children but also is linking in with their community and we've been talking a huge amount about how to keep that community connected because these students are going from being social every day to being isolated within their space and not having that social connection which is going to be a pretty huge shift for all of those students mm -hmm. so we're sort of looking for ways um, using things like kids blog or things like that where they have spaces that we're monitoring and we're moderating that they can come into add into give each other feedback link into the research ideas of each other and have that two-way communication instead of it being all we're giving you the content you're giving us back the content to the educator and losing that collaboration and losing that community that is so essential in their school day so we're really looking at finding a way to continue the joy, continue the research and continue the community at the same time as giving the fundamental basics that we need to do. And I also just to add to that and understanding context fully, I feel like this has been a good conversation because it's opened up and become more expansive um, in that we've shifted away from just talking about delivery to looking at how we're going to move the power dynamics, where the responsibility for learning lies and who's going to step into the space as the learner and I think that's been a really important step forward in this conversation because it's very easy for us to build our scenarios from our existing narratives. And I guess what Peter and I are really interested in is what are the multiple scenarios that we could build from different narratives and different perspectives now that could add value to this moving forward and see this as an opportunity um, rather than a challenge we're leaning into. But if the tasks aren't valuable to them and they don't know why they're doing it, they're not gonna wanna do it and they're gonna stop doing it after a few days because they're gonna say, this is nonsense, I can rather learn something about what I wanna do. Mm -hmm. And I, some of that is getting those students' voice into saying, okay, so what are you doing at home? Why are you doing it? And how can we help you learn more that way? Instead of just looking back at that unit plan and saying, okay, we had planned on doing this about this in biology. It's more about, okay, how can you learn about something like this at home? Um, I'm very conscious that many schools and the government are using the phrase closure. Yeah, good point. Super conscious of the fact that the reality is none of these schools are closing. Not one of these schools are closing, even if they have opted to have not have their students physically on campus. It's continuous learning. And, and I'm just very conscious that I've just heard a report earlier today that Scott Morrison has said that if schools are closing against their direction, there could be funding implications. So I think it's really, I think it's really important that we help with the, with the actual language and narrative because language is so important. If we, if we can help minimise anxiety for the staff, the parents and the students and simply say, look, it's business kind of as usual, as much as it can be, and we're, we're, we're just migrating so much of our um, 
on-campus kind of learning to an online or remote space and that we have put structures in place for learning to be continuous, for well-being to be continuous, for check-ins to continue to occur. I think we have to take ownership of that language and maybe stop using the word closure. Yeah. Okay. Good on you guys. Continue Thank to you very much. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, everyone.